Thank you, music ministry. Please remain standing as we read God's word together. We are in Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, and today we are looking at verses 43 through 45. Now when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came, and when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the last state of the man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will also be with this evil generation. Let's pray. Father God, we approach a text that requires wisdom and discernment and understanding, and so we seek that from you now, that you give us this wisdom, discernment, and understanding from on high, that your Holy Spirit is preaching to every one of our hearts, and you make your words known to us. Preach to us now, Lord, through your word, and may we all be edified through today's preaching. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> we approach a section of Scripture where our Lord gives an analogy. That's what we just read was an analogy. And it would, uh, it would benefit us to address the spiritual realm in order to understand this analogy better. There are three great enemies that the follower of Christ will have to face their entire life. So often in so many ministries, we're so used to hearing that life gets better as we become the followers of Christ. And in a way, it does. But life does not get easier. Life on earth does not get easier when we walk in faithfulness. When you are called by Christ, you are called into war. This is why there's so much war language in the New Testament. This is why there's so much competitive language in the New Testament. There are people out there who do not think the New Testament contains any type of war language, and then they'll go off and get a tattoo about putting the whole armor of God on. That's an image of war. That's an image of battle. We are called into war, and we face three great enemies. The first enemy we always have to remember, not only of ourselves, but of all those around us as well. And that is ourselves, our own fallen nature. We are sinners, and we will sin, and we do sin. Our flesh is our, one of our great enemies. This is something that we are either forgetting, in our, not only in our churches, but in our culture, or we are abandoning, abandoning it. And because this is being forsaken, we're always scrambling in our minds trying to figure out what in the world's going on. How come the world is so wicked? How come it's going deeper into this despair and into this darkness? Well, it's the same thing that's always been going on. Sin. You see, when people are always trying to scramble in their minds about where does evil come from, the scriptures provide it for us. Sin is the source of this evil that we are witnessing. But we have, to, we, have, we have no more self-awareness. We don't have any awareness. The sooner we understand this about ourselves and about our loved ones and, uh, and about the world, the easier it is to process what is taking place around us. You are a sinner. Your spouse is a sinner. Your children and grandchildren are sinners. Your parents are sinners. Your grandparents are are sinners. And it's because of this sin, they will fail. We will all fail. We will let each other down sooner or later. Why do, do, do my, does my, do my children have this attitude? Why does my spouse have this attitude? Why are they snappy like this in this moment? Why are my children snappy like this in this moment? Why am I having this turmoil with this person? It is a sin issue. 
And it's something we are battling daily. The battle, however, is so common, it's so common and we are so used to it that we wake up and we think it's just a normal day. It's not a normal day. We wake up and go, okay, it's time to put on the clothes, go to work, go through the day, come home and have family time. No, it's another day of waging war with yourself. But it's so mundane, we don't even think about that when we wake up. You are waking up on another day to wage war with yourself. You may think it's a good day, but wait until that one person cuts you off. Wait until that one individual just rubs you the wrong way. Wait until anybody rubs you the wrong way. Wait until you lose your patience over something. Wait until somebody makes you mad. Sin will take control before you even know it. This is such a common enemy, we don't even wage the battle. We don't even wage war against it because we think it's so normal. But we are sinners, and it is our flesh is one of our great enemies. Another great enemy that Scripture gives us is the world. Now, I'm not talking about planet Earth. World has multiple meanings in the pages of Scripture. In some areas, it does mean Earth, the planet Earth. Context will always inform us of what the Scriptures are trying to communicate to us whether it's the planet Earth or something else, but it's also a word used to talk about temporal materialism. Now, you have to be careful with your understanding of the word materialism or a materialist, because in our, in our common age, often, when we think of that word, people think of just possessions, but it's not always possessions. A materialist is always looking for pleasures of some sort. That could be the lust of the flesh. They're focused on the things of earth, what is made up of matter, what is made up of material. That's materialism in the classic definition, in the classic sense. It's not just merely possessions. It includes possessions, but it doesn't just mean an overabundance of possessions. It has to do with all earthly pleasures. But in the context of what we call worldly, it is often confused. For example, the Amish consider electricity worldly because, because the world have it, we won't. Well, that's actually not the context of the definition of worldly. It's not because the world is doing it, therefore we deny ourselves. The world is eating. The world eats food. We don't deny ourselves of food. The way we should understand the biblical concept of being worldly is when, when the things of earth, the possessions, the materials, the lust of the flesh, our desires, that's even the desire to, uh, uh, to, be, to, to, to go places, to be entertained, whatever it is, they rob us of our faithfulness and dedication to God. That is in the context of being worldly. Now, the way that I just stated that is, is more from a biblical kind of view. The people who are behaving this way do not see themselves as a person being robbed of their faithfulness or their dedication to God. It's never viewed that way. It's easy to explain it from the biblical point of view, but is this something we're guilty of? So it's whenever earthly comforts, earthly pleasures, uh, and even earthly systems, whatever it may be, when they become a priority in our lives above God and his word and his worship that's owed to him. When we give in to what the scriptures called the, the passing pleasures. And it's when these things rob us of actually being actively faithful to God in our duty to God. Now, this is one of the great enemies because it's something that we are battling all the time. And again, it is so mundane that we don't even realize we are at war. Who has the majority of our time? What activities do we do that prevent us from actually being faithful? We are in the world, but we're not of the world. There has to be a proper balance, in other words, in our life and in our dedication. So our worldliness to behave like that which is worldly is when we give in to earthly pleasures 
at the sacrifice of being dedicated to God and obedient to God. It's when we decide that certain comforts or certain entertainments are more valuable to us than the commands from Scripture and our dedication to God. And it also means to conform to this type of thinking and living. It's not just giving in, but conforming to it. Now, when you realize what true worldliness looks like, then it's no surprise that what we hear from people is, you know what? Do what makes you happy. The heart wants what the heart wants. Those statements should not be surprising when we understand worldliness. These are all worldly philosophies because it's all about giving into the material, giving into matter. This enemy is so great that it's always defeating us and we don't even know it. We think it's just another normal day. The last great enemy, and we have to remember that there's not just three enemies we will face, but there's three major enemies that the Bible gives us. The last one, the last enemy is satan satanic and demonic forces or influence. Satan himself, Satan and his adversaries. And this is where the focus of our attention is going to be at for today. We had talked about those those other two enemies, so we can better understand the tactics of the enemy. Because this enemy will use our own sin against us, will use earthly pleasures against us, and will attempt to trick us all the time. Now, when it comes to demonic forces, there are a lot of theories out there, a lot of speculations, there are a lot of nonsense that is written and preached out there. And the fact of the matter is, we are the followers of Christ, and Christ God, in his triune nature, gave us his word and preserved his word. So we speak where the Bible speaks, and we are silent where the Bible is silent. The scriptures inform us that demonic forces were at one time angelic beings. This is from 2 Peter chapter 2. We read in Isaiah chapter 14 that Satan wanted to have the throne for himself. Some say he wanted to be like God. When I read Isaiah chapter 14, I actually get the impression that he wanted to be higher than God. As far as why he wanted this, pow uh, this power, why he wanted to be like God, or even higher than God, why he actually re re rebelled, we do not know. One thing that we have to understand when it comes to angelic beings, when it comes to angelic beings, whether they're fallen or not, there's much mystery around them. We only know what the scriptures tells us, and there's many questions we can ask when it comes to angelic beings. We just don't know everything about these beings. But what we know of demonic forces is that they were angelic beings created for the service of God, and we are told in Revelation that a third of the created angelic beings fell with Satan. We're not certain why they fell with him. I mean, we can speculate. I think it's reasonable con to conclude that they rebelled as well. That's obvious. But I don't get the impression that they were all gunning for the same throne. We only hear of one who was gunning for a throne. So when we contemplate these things, we have to understand that there's actually very little said about the fall of these angelic beings. Some early Christian writers believe that Satan had, a, uh, had angels working for him and that they followed him in the fall. But we just don't know. Jonathan Edwards expanded on a thought that's very interesting that he developed because of some research that he did into the early church. He found uh, certain things stated in the 4th century, and he also found that it was uh, a belief that was held by some of the reformers. And they're taking into consideration Ezekiel 28, where Satan is described as a cherub who is described as the guardian over Eden. He was like this angel that was meant to protect Eden. Protect that which was over earth. In light of this, this led to some speculations. And the speculation was that God revealed to the angels that one person of the triune God will, will put on the flesh of man and be God incarnate. And that's 
why Satan rebelled. He rebelled at the idea of worshiping flesh. That's where the, the, the animosity began, is that Satan could not bring himself to the idea of worshiping flesh, that God would dawn on the flesh of man and that he must one day worship that flesh. And this is the reason why a third of heaven went with him, because they too rebelled against this idea. Now, this is pure speculation, but the ultimate conclusion we have to make is that God allowed the fall of angelic beings to take place for a purpose. And it was for his glory in some way or another. These created beings are not outside of his, his control, but it was all done for a purpose. And again, we have to recognize that there is mystery around this. God is not obligated to provide to us every answers of all things. Another thing we have to recognize is that there will be no redemption or forgiveness for any of these angels, these fallen angels. None. Jesus did not come as an angelic being. He came as a human being. He didn't atone for the sins of angels. He atoned for the sins of man. This is why the incarnation is so important. And so the wrath of God in the lake of fire is for the purpose of the full wrath of God to be poured out upon these rebellious, fallen, angelic beings. Another interesting thought that developed early on in the Christian church in the Orient, um, this goes very, very far back, is that they believe that people who were not saved when they died, their spirits got active in the kingdom of Satan in deceiving people, that they became a demonic force they themselves to mislead others. It's not based off scripture, it's pure speculation, but it's an interesting thought. We have to understand that demonic forces do have a type of power. They do have the ability to mislead, and they use that ability all the time. They even have the ability to manipulate weather. We see that in the pages of Scripture. That there is an evil kingdom, and Satan is in control of that kingdom. It's not a kingdom that will stand, and it's not a kingdom that's compared or in competition to the heavenly kingdom, but it's a kingdom nonetheless. You can look at it this way. Everybody belongs to a kingdom. It's just a matter of which kingdom you belong to. All who are not saved belong to the kingdom of Satan, or the kingdom of this world, as it's called. The, the prince and ruler of the air. And Satan's great goal is to make sure that not only his kingdom is always growing, but that nobody is leaving it. There are many theologians in, in, throughout history that have devoted much time to the study of demonology in the pages of Scripture. And it's Scripture that we must turn to for this topic. This is not a topic you want to mess around with. This is not a topic you want to play games with. If we start to go in other places and listening to other people who are not standing on the authority of God's word, we are playing with fire. If we go to people who are not basing their teachings out of Scripture, then, then we are in trouble. But there have been some great teachers who have done some faithful studies on this topic throughout history. Jonathan Edwards is one of them. A uh, Puritan by the name of Isaac Ambrose has a very powerful teaching from Ephesians 6. But one Puritan who really took the time to want to equip his people and his listeners was a man by the name of William Spurstow. He took the study of Satan and demons in the pages of Scripture very seriously because he knew that the people of God needed to be equipped for warfare. Because we already have a fallen nature and we're living in a corrupt world, so we need to know the devices of Satan and his demons and how they attempt to entice us in order to wage war. So he created a list of devices that demonic forces use against God's people. He really wanted to give his, his listeners a fighting chance when it came to temptations, when it came to their fallen nature, when it came to living in this world. And so based off his study of Scripture, I want to share some of the devices he listed. Now, we don't have time to go through all the devices that he talks about. He went through great lengths on this study. So we'll just point out a few. 
So one device is that Satan leads people from lesser sins to greater sins. He doesn't lay all his cards out on the table right there. He starts subtly. He starts slowly. The idea is not to give people the suspicion he is evil or give people the suspicion of presence of evil, but to slowly pull them away, to slowly entice them away. And he gave a remedy for that. And it's Ephesians 4, 27, to take heed of giving no place to the devil. Another device, he says, is that the devil persistently urges people to a particular sin. It's not sin in general, but he knows your weaknesses and he entices you to a particular sin. This was drawn from the Gospel of John, by the way, chapter 13. Judas was given a particular sin to commit. It's not just the mere thought put into our minds, but there's the, also the, the promise of pleasure with it. And that's another device, the promise of pleasure. In the case with Judas, that was money. He sways the sinful mind and he presses persistently until people succumb to their temptation. He is so subtle with the suggestions that it can appear as if it's our own thoughts. And he concluded that based on Peter's reaction when Jesus told him about his coming death. If you remember, Jesus was telling the disciples about his coming death, and we'll study this in detail. And Peter thought he was acting according to his own words when he said, may it never be. And what did Jesus say to him? He said, get behind me, Satan. Turns out Peter was being a pawn for Satan. And he thought it was his own thoughts. Jesus recognized it as something satanic. And the remedy that he gave, and I'm giving the short version, folks. Like I said, he went through detail. I'm giving the short ver uh, 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 version of this. Is to reject all of the promises of sin. It promises you satisfaction. It promises you that you will be satisfied in some way, that you'll receive some type of pleasure, some types of benefit. And what he is saying is you reject all those promises. They're false promises. He made the statement that mankind actually prefers peace with sin rather than waging war with the devil. I agree with him. We rather live at peace with sin than wage war. Another device that Satan uses, and for the sake of time and conversation, we'll have to make this our last one. But the device is strategy of time. That Satan is very strategic with his timing and when he draws us out of our position of strength. So he lets the sinful mind believe that they're making prog progress. He lets the sinful mind believe that, that, uh, that they're getting slowly away from them. And what he's doing is he's, he's, he lets the sinner puff themselves up with pride. And a, in a moment, he comes and cuts them down. When, when, when the sinner believes that they're gaining strength, that's when he goes on his attack. Because it makes the sinner feel like a complete failure, that it's futile, that they can't win. And the remedy that he gave is he said that Christians need to learn to not live so comfortably. That our lifestyle should be ready for war at all times and we need to take serious, serious consideration into life's luxuries. His argument is, is that luxuries weaken our watchfulness. He's not wrong. We're taking an honest consideration. He is not wrong. He has a way, way more in-depth study behind this. It's a very interesting study. But we need to understand that the heinousness and evilness of demonic forces, just covering a few just to understand it, 
Not only do they use these devices, but they are capable of entering into human beings. And in this section of scripture that we're looking at today, it's, it's an analogy, and that's important to remember. We're going to emphasize that throughout, throughout the sermon. But it's an analogy used by our Lord that focuses our sight on how demonic spirits work. Not only on how demonic spirits work, but it's an analogy of a generation. It's a small section of scripture that we're looking at right now, but it's an important one. And we cannot miss the point that our Lord is trying to make. And there is a far greater point than what we are talking about now. So let's dive into God's word together. And let's look at this again. Let's look at verses 43 and 44. Now then, the unclean spirit goes out of a man. It passes through waterless places, seeking rest, and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came, and when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. As we have discussed in the past with the, this gospel specifically, and specifically this chapter, Matthew does not give the historical narrative of Jesus in chronological order. This is not the way he presents it. He follows themes. He sticks with themes. As we stated when we first began this gospel, it is believed that it was intended for a Jewish audience. So Matthew deals with specific themes that tend to appeal to the ancient Jewish mind, to the ancient Jewish way of thinking. Matthew tends to focus more on, on certain things that the other gospel writers don't focus on. He tends to expand on things that they do talk about, but he takes them in further detail in some areas. And then in some areas, he decides to kind of speed them up to get to another point that would appeal to the Jewish mind. This chapter that we are looking at has the theme of opposition, which is what we've been talking about, that this is the opposition chapter. He is telling the truth, but he's just whipping them out as a theme. He's just giving us these different stories of this opposition, one, one to another. And if you're just kind of reading through, it seems like, the, like it's all back to back to back. And really, they're kind of separate events. And so we approach a section of Scripture that, that fits here, but doesn't fit neatly. And there's a reason for that. When we cross-reference this with Luke, Luke puts these words that Jesus is telling his, the Pharisees about the unforgivable sin. That's where Luke puts this section of Scripture, right after he preaches about the unforgivable sin. And it seems to be more fitting in that context. Jesus cast out a demon uh, uh, from, a, from a blind mute man, and the Pharisees, Pharisees accused Jesus of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul. And in Luke's account, it's right after the line, he who is not with me is against me, that Jesus says the very words that we're reading now, that we're looking at today. But again, Matthew is dealing with a theme, and that theme here is, is, is all the situations in, in, a, in, in a, a span of time that Jesus faced this opposition. But then we have this, this little section right here that doesn't seem to fit as neatly. It is fitting, but it makes more sense to have these words stated right after the casting out of demons and those specific words, he who is not with me is against me. But for Matthew, uh, he puts it at the end of this opposition. But there's a grand point to this chapter, and Matthew, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, decided to put this at the end of this grand point of, uh, uh, and how these words shall be used. And perhaps it makes sense after we describe what is being said in more detail. But because Matthew is not in chronological order, and because Matthew is dealing with the, with the theme uh, of, of opposition, chances are it was probably said as told by Luke. That that's when this statement that we're looking at now was actually said. Of course, of course Matthew's accounts are still what was said by our Lord, and the things that were done by our Lord is just organized differently. Some people take that to mean it's a contradiction, that they don't line up. If I were to ask you to share some stories about a time when your dad was happy, or share a few stories of times when your dad was angry, you may give me these stories back to back. They are all true stories. 
But because there is a topic, because there is a theme in mind, you are delivering it in a very specific way. It doesn't make those stories any less true, and it doesn't contradict anything. You're just delivering the stories in a specific order. The theme that is happy, you give us a bunch of stories about when he was happy. You stick with that theme. Where he's angry, you stick with that theme. Matthew is sticking with a theme. So it will do us well to understand this text the way that Matthew is presenting it to us, but and it, we're going to try and understand it this way because that's the gospel we're going through, but we're also going to take into consideration Luke's account and piece these pictures together. And we're doing this for a purpose. So our Lord makes a statement, and it's an analogy. So it takes a little bit of thought to consider what, is, what he is saying. He's talking about an unclean spirit, which we know is a demonic spirit. Anytime you see that phrase, unclean spirit, that means demonic spirit. And the demonic spirit, the spirit leaves this man and passes through a, a waterless place. That's a description of a desert, of a wilderness. And that the spirit is seeking rest. And that's not the type of rest that we're thinking about. We shouldn't think that this demon like got out of this man. He says, you know what? I just need a break from myself. I need a little time to put my feet up and just, just get a little vacation from myself. Angels were created to do good. And when these angels rebelled and fell, they lost that goodness. Now all they can do is evil. If demonic forces are doing good, it's with evil intentions. And, of course, I'm talking about a superficial good. It's not good according to God's standards. We're talking about a, a world, worldly standard of good according to materialism. But this spirit is going off into the wilderness to find rest. What does that mean? Well, it's in their nature to do what is evil, that they're always doing what is evil, that they enjoy evil. So it's looking for someone else to take over. And we are told he does not find it. Chances are what is being communicated here, if we apply historical context, is that the wilderness is what's outside of Israel. If the audience is, in fact, a Jewish audience, we want to try and understand it the best way we can, we can by placing our minds in their minds to our best ability. And the way that they understand something like this, a phrase like this, the wilderness, the desert, meant outside of Israel. Israel was the promised land. It was the land of, the mil of milk and honey. No matter what they were going through, they still considered it the promised land and the land of milk and honey, even if they were in absolute famine. Beyond that, this is the, the, is the wilderness. There's um, the desert, the wilderness. That's considered the Gentile region. That's where the Gentiles are. So it seems that the analogy is that the unclean spirit, the demon, went out of this individual and went off into the wilderness, the Gentile region region and it found no rest kind of a foreshadow of the gospel going out now this is not a statement that gentiles can never be affected by demonic forces or they can never be possessed by anything like that keep in mind this is just an analogy that has a point analogies are meant to point to something but they're not meant to build a major solid doctrine off of that so we don't conclude that no gentile can be demon possessed or if we go out into the desert demons can't touch us that's not what we're that's not the point here we got to be careful when we look at analogies not to read too much into them jesus is trying to make a specific point so it's not it's not a it's not a definite teaching of what demons can or cannot do so keep that in mind as we work through this so the, uns the unclean spirit goes to somewhere deserted, a desert, a wilderness, going to find rest, possibly another individual, perhaps causing chaos somewhere else, but could not find a place to do what it's in its nature to do, which is evil. So the de demonic spirit decides, you know what, I will return back to my house, the person he just left. And when he comes back, he finds it unoccupied. The person he left before, when he comes back, nothing is filling that space that was left open when the demon left. The person is still unoccupied. However, even though it was unoccupied, it was swept up and kept in order. Now here is how it's fitting in the way that Luke presents it, which again is probably the chronological accurate way of looking at this. 
They accused Jesus of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul. Jesus scorned them for that and stated that a kingdom divided cannot stand. He then tells them that he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. And then he delivers this analogy. The picture that our Lord is painting is that of a man who has evil within him. And that evil leaves for a while, but while that evil was gone, the house was tidy. Meaning that the person was keeping things in order, was keeping things swept, was keeping things tidy, even though he was still dead inside. Nothing was occupied in him. If demonic forces go off somewhere and they cannot find rest, it's because they cannot find occupation. It's because those people were already occupied. Occupied by who? Other demons? No. Occupied by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God in those people had those people, had those homes occupied, and no demon will find rest where the Holy Spirit is occupied. So the demonic force, the demonic spirit comes back to his old home and he finds it still unoccupied, meaning this person did not have the Holy Spirit. But even though the demon was gone, and we don't know how long, but the demon was gone, the house was still swept and tidy. The house was put in order. This was somebody who was looking clean, who was pretending to be clean on the outside, but was unoccupied on the inside. Now, in the context, in the way that Luke is presenting this, he's presenting this in a way where we're talking about religious hypocrisy. People who pretend to be righteous on the outside, but during that time of pretending to be righteous, they were really just unoccupied. The Spirit of God was not in them. So when the evil spirit comes back, they find that the house is swept and it's tidy, but still no God in them. They have this look to them, but the important part is missing. And this is the message that Jesus is communicating to these religious leaders. This is the analogy here. You don't have the spirit of God in you. What you are doing is all show, but it's all temporary. As Jesus goes on to say, verse 45. Then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the last state of the man becomes worse than the first state. That is the way it will be, that will be also with this evil generation. So the evil demon goes and finds seven other evil demons, and they all go to live in one person. A lot of people put a lot of attention on seven being used here. They're curious why Jesus used seven as a, uh, as it be, you know, seven as being a representation of, of a perfect number. Why did he use that when talking about demonic forces? There could be a few reasons, but perhaps you can look at it as an act of judgment. But you can also look at it as there's actually eight demons present, not seven. The one demon went and gathered seven, making a total of eight in that one person. And they all decided to go and live in this man and they make him worse than what he was before. Now this is not a statement that all Pharisees are demon possessed. It's an analogy. It's presenting a vivid picture. So after the religious hypocrites had been pretending to be right, but just when the demonic spirit comes back, the demonic spirit finds that this individual is unoccupied, so it gathers more demonic spirits uh, and, and now this person is far more worse than they were before. And so the picture that Luke kind of paints for us is you can, you can keep up the facade all you want. You can pretend to be righteous, but over time and in due time, we will find out that you are far more worse than what you are pretending to be. You may keep your house tidy. You may have things swept up, but it's only going to be momentarily. And over time, you will become far more worse. This is the picture he's painting. And we know people like this. We know people who were raised in, in, in Christian homes who at some point in their life, uh, they, they, they 
walked away. We know people who were raised in the church and they were happy at one point. And you've seen them there in fellowship and you saw progress and then suddenly they fell away and they fell away hard. And it was all because they were putting on a show. They were trying to keep up an image. This is what the analogy is pointing to. They were unoccupied that entire time. You could pretend to be this way. It may look like this, but over time, evil will set in and you will be far worse than what you were before. And because you're putting on this facade, you will, you will be worse than when you first started because you will now be exposed. Now, Matthew presents it in a slightly different way, though. It's still the same point, but Matthew uses it as kind of like a, like a final ribbon, a final bow on this entire opposition section. Even though the chapter is not closed, uh, he kind of uses it as a closing thought. And we have to keep in mind that Luke's account, it does flow right after those words, he who is not with me is against me. And that's the entire theme of Matthew chapter 12. He who is not with me is against me. So while that's the theme, it's still fitting, but doesn't fit as neatly. And the theme is, again, this pushing back, this opposition against Jesus. And when opposition faces him, what does he do? He pushes back at them. And he comes with intense language, and he calls them out. He doesn't mince his words at all. He calls them evil. He calls them the sons of snakes. He calls them unforgivable. And now he's using an, an analogy, calling them demon-possessed. So these words that we're looking at now serve as kind of a, that bow of all these situations that we have covered in this chapter. And he says that this is what this will be like with this evil gener generation. You look tidy on the outside. People think you're good. People think you're righteous, but you will be exposed for who you truly are. And it's going to be far worse than what it was before. And the theme in both Matthew and Luke combined is you cannot have it both ways. He who is not with me is against me. And then Jesus goes on to say these very words. Yes, dear friends, life as a Christian does not get easier. Because it's not a life of having your cake and eating it too. There was never a promise to us that being in this world will be easier. Matter of fact, the opposite was promised. But we really can't have it both ways. We cannot behave like the children of serpents while claiming to be the children of God. This is a stern warning from our Lord that he is talking about these, how evil these actions are. And the Pharisees were completely delusional about their own wickedness. But frankly, so are all of us. We're all kind of delusional because that's what sin does. And that's what demonic forces lead us to do, lead us to think. The analogy uses demonic spirits because Satan his whole goal is to destroy what is good and to bring us down with him. Anything he can do to draw us away, he will do. In the analogy that was given, the house, meaning the person, didn't seem to know that an evil spirit has left him. He kept the house in order while the demon was away, while the house was still unoccupied. No clue that, that, that an evil presence has departed. Leaving himself open for far worse, a far worse evil. So the analogy is fitting not only for religious hypocrisy, but for all those who are perishing as they presently living in the kingdom of the serpent. It's a ruined kingdom. It's a run down kingdom. It's a kingdom that will not stand. And it's a kingdom that many of our loved ones are presently in. And they show it. Based on the analogy that we're looking at, they show it. They may have their house in order and swept. It looks good on the outside. They say all the right things. They may even do all the right things. 
But friends, we have loved ones and we have friends who live unoccupied. And demonic forces will do whatever it will take to keep them unoccupied. Whether that's through possession or keeping them from the means of grace so they never hear the good news. The means of grace. That's a phrase we don't hear enough in church anymore. What does God use to impart grace onto us? Our scripture reading, our time of prayer, time of fellowship, being faithful in gathering at, with the assembly, being faithful in our walk and in the ordinances, that is the baptism in the Lord's table. These are not just some religious acts that we observe. These are means of grace, how God imparts his grace onto us. This is not only the reason why God commands us to do these things, but it's the very reason why Jesus died to establish these things. Oh, we would treat the church so much more different if we realized that when, when, when the second person of the Trinity, when the God-man offered up his flesh and blood, it was to inaugurate the very situation you are sitting in right now. So many people say, I don't need the church. Then why did Jesus die to establish it? Sure, it can become a chore for many people. Our sinful fallen nature can treat this as something unholy. There can be people in here right now who are just keeping things tidy. They're kind of keeping things swept but are unoccupied. But we have many friends and loved ones who bear no fruit and show no fruit of the salvation whatsoever while proclaiming that they are the people of God. This is demonic. The analogy is, look, you can pretend to be this way. You can say all the right words. But in the end, it's going to be far worse for you than it was before. Okay, if I'm faking it, and this is just a, just a mere image, how much worse is it going to be for me later? And what Jesus is saying is he's saying it's going to be seven times worse for you. That's the analogy. We can count our blessings, but sometimes we're counting certain things the wrong way. Because unrighteous people have blessings too. How many times has the psalmist said, God, why do the unrighteous prosper? Because they do. And unrighteous people count their blessings as well. Man, look at the good job that I have. Look at, look at this nice employment that I have. And look at the family that I've built. And look at the house that I have. And look at the cars that I've bought. And look at that, all that I have. In the short amount of time that I've, I've built this. And in that time, maybe I opened up the pages of scripture four times. And God is still happy with me because look, look at what I got going on for me. Just look at the situation. But what did we just discuss? We have three great enemies. Our fallen nature the world, and Satan. And they all work together. People think that they are not demon-led because there's not some ugly beast after them. But what we have covered is that the, the drawing away, that's subtle. It's light. It's not intense evil. It's a very subtle drawing away. Folks, what we have to understand is sometimes... Getting what we want is not always a good thing. That could be a bad sign. And when we're sitting there playing this game, just look at all that I got. Look at what God has blessed me with. And we know, we know they're not walking according to the means of grace. That's not blessings from God. 
That's demonic forces using the world to provide possessions, keeping people thinking that they are blessed when they're not. Yes, sin promises pleasure. That's why we do it. And sometimes the pleasure is a family and the house and the cars and the bank account and all of that stuff. You have it all. We say, look how blessed I am. And the fact of the matter is, is that could be Satan led. That's a reality. That is the war that we fight. Every day when you wake up, it's wartime. Not even when you wake up, when you go to sleep, it's wartime. You got to fight those bad dreams off and sinful thoughts that enter your mind when you're not even coherent, really. All the time, under the attack. And so we'll close with this thought from Paul out of Ephesians, chapter 4. And beginning at verse 25. He says, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. Do we all get this? We are to speak truth no matter what. The truth of God's word, the truth of scripture. We don't do it to ourselves, but we do it not just to ourselves, but we do it to those around us as well. We speak truth. We are the people of truth. God is truth. We are to be the people of truth. And truth is always on our side. That's something we need to recognize when we wake up in the mornings too. When you wake up, the truth is on your side so far as you are walking in it and obedient to it. We have the truth on our side. Speak truth. And why do we speak this truth? Paul continues, for we are members of one another. Now he's speaking of the fellowship of believers. We speak truth to each other. This is how we will encourage each other. This is how we will lift each other up. Paul continues in verse 26, be angry, yet do not sin. If it's a righteous anger, then it's not a sinful anger. But you have to be careful when it comes to anger because it will turn into sin very fast. But we are told to be angry. Get a little mad. It's okay to get mad. The world wants to devour your flesh. Satan wants to devour you. And Satan just doesn't want to devour you. He wants everybody around you. Get a little mad. And we will be wise to start thinking about this as we communicate with our loved ones that this is, what, this is who Satan wants. We've gotten soft. There's no anger stirring up within us. He wants them all, so get a little mad. They're not immune just because you have a relationship with God. You're not immune to the, to the tactics of Satan. So when you start thinking about that, and I want you to think about that, I want you to think about the people closest to you burning in hell. And I want you to get mad about it and don't just sit there in your anger, but do something about it. Because that is a reality. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. He's saying today, do something about it. You know you got people like this around you. Do something about it today. Don't let the sun go down on this. Everyone thinks it's about like this internal struggle about this anger. No, be angry about this. And then verse 27, what does he say in verse 27? And do not give the devil an opportunity. Do not allow him not only for ourselves, but for your neighbors as well. Now you can only do so much when it comes to your neighbors, when it comes to the people around you. But there is something you can do. I mean, look around, people. Look at your brothers and sisters in this room right now. Look around at everybody. Do not allow him to have an opportunity over the very ones in this room. That's the instruction he's giving. Fight for them. 
Don't just fight for yourselves. Fight for them too. Those who are sitting in the, in the pews right now and those who are closest to us. Fight for them. Be angry for them. Be zealous to protect their souls. Do not let the devil have an opportunity against you or them. And when you're done here, looking after the souls of each other, go and do the same for your loved ones who are not here. This is the truth of what Christ is communicating to us. This is the analogy of this opposition towards Christ. The opposition comes in many forms. It's not always the evil ugliness that Hollywood paints it up to be. We have three great enemies that we are always at war with. And it's time God's people start fighting back. So when we are done being mad for ourselves, being mad for others in this room, Let's get mad over our loved ones, too, and guard their souls. Let's pray. Father God, I'm very thankful for this analogy that is given to us, preserved in Scripture, scripture said by you, Lord Jesus. Allow us to heed these words and the analogy that is given and just to ponder and meditate on these things and how Living a swept up, tidy life is not what you've called us to do, but how your spirit wants to occupy us. And so, Lord, I pray that in our hearts and in our minds and in our actions, we wage war against our great adversary, Satan himself. I pray that in our hearts and in our minds, we wage war against our great adversary, that is, ourselves. I pray that in our minds and our hearts and our soul, we wage war against our great adversary, that is the world. And we fight because we have been called to war. And we not only fight for ourselves, but for all those around us, our loved ones, our neighbors, our co-workers. Let us realize that sin and Satan are having a heyday within uh, this world and that we will no longer allow him to have the opportunity. I pray we stand firm and grounded on the truth of your word, and that we're always led by truth. I pray that all of us in here encourage each other in brotherly and sisterly love that can only come from you, Lord Jesus. And it's in your precious name we pray. Amen.